Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Have a nice day. Whatever your time zone is and wherever you are listening to us, you are definitely at the right spot. And yes, you are a bit surprised because we announced Vini and Cindini. But as the weather decided to change a bit and before he gets wet feet and the hurricane drops by, he preferred some safer regions. And we were lucky to get our friend John ERP uh, read at the camera and to our comfort and amidst our discussion. And um, thank you very much, John, as I enjoyed very much our last session we had together here in the CRM Convo, where you introduced us to hybrid events. We discussed a lot about your open hardcore mastery and specialization. And I was really learning a lot about helping and what could be done from that point on. And also, I am very grateful um, when I have the opportunity to read one of your pieces in your regularly um, newsletters, such as uh, The Software Connoisseur and Critical Thinker in Our Community. That's from my end. Now, please... Wow. Tell the audience a bit about your career, your interests, and a word about yourself, please. After you made him blush, old boy. Uh, hi, I'm Vinnie Merchandani. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's funny. I'm more like Vinnie's foil. Uh, Vinny, uh, Vinny and I have vigorous arguments at shows, which are probably pretty entertaining to watch. But but um, they are. He, he's a. Uh, He's he's a he's a he's a good colleague, and I'm sure he'll be great when he when he shows up. Sorry for anyone who's disappointed, but I'll I'll try to at least make it interesting. But um, yeah, uh, I'm a co-founder of Genomica. I've been around this space for a long time, and I like to look at real world transformation. And I think that industry clouds fit into that. So let's see how we do. Yeah. So what is your understanding about an industry cloud? Because um, I'm so old school with my over 60 plus years, um, nearly closing into Vinny's age, but not yet there, as I researched that he is 65 now, and um, I published less books. So I think there is a lot to go in the next two years. I have to manage. <laughs> mm. um, industry clouds, what is your understanding about it? And what is the differentiation to somebody fiddling around and creating a template in his software, either ERP or ISU. Right. Well, uh, first of all, industry cloud is a great way to advance your career in marketing in our industry by taking existing functionality <laughs> and creating yes. a nice, sexy new term that gets everyone excited. And then when they start scratching under the surface, they get more and more confused. Hallelujah. So, how, how does that sound? <laughs> that sounds like my expectation. You manage my expectation. A big wrapping of shitty glossy paper around the same wrap as yesterday. Would that to be some extent, hard? that's true. And keep some extent, consultants busy. Thank you yep. very much. Mm -hmm. To some extent, that's true. And, and, and yeah. yet, I think our job as grizzled veterans of this industry is to do better than that. So we, we can make fun of marketing a little bit because they're trying to sell software and they're trying to make things sound sexy and cool. But our job is to figure out and help understand what is really new and different and why and what is not new and different. Now, I don't get too hung up on whether or not we can use a term or not. We, I'm happy to use it. I, I hate the term. I won't use it in my writing. Uh, but, um, but I don't think that's the important thing. The important thing is what I just said is what's new and different. That, that makes a difference for customers and what's not new and different. And that might be okay too. Um, but we need to understand this. And I actually did prepare a few things for you on these topics so we can get in. Oh, cool. So yep. we, someone did their homework. I did. Yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. We don't do our the last one. You are <laughs> yeah. really smart, really cool. One thing I can tell you is that, um, ERP obviously has, I think, a little bit of a head start on this topic versus CRM, and I didn't trace yeah. all the ERP lineage on this, but but with, with the emergence of cloud ERP solutions of the multi-tenant variety, which goes back quite a long time now, um, all of these vendors did uh, 
begin to think about industry focus pretty pretty early on. Um, yeah. CRM is a little bit later to that game. You can trace some milestones. I mean, I think one of the big milestones in, in CRM around industries was the uh, Salesforce acquisition of Velocity, and I believe that was 2020 now. Mm-hmm. Uh, f- for more than a billion dollars and that was kind of there's an article on diginomic on that by phil wainwright um getting into s- the significance of that but um i think that that's kind of a mile marker if you will it's not obviously there's a lot more going on in crm with industries than that but that's a little bit of a marker as far as like the wake-up call of like most software needs to think about industry specific users much more than it does and there's very very little software that is generalist per se and we got away with serving up a lot of generalist software to, to customers and it underperformed but now and we can get into this in much more detail if you want in the era of machine learning artificial intelligence workflow automation low code no code yes. Application silos and industry-specific proprietary softwares fail, and so that's why we have to take a harder look at industry, in so-called industry clouds today. I applaud, and so uh, have- aside of applauding the quick the quick entering in CRM in Europe started with some industrial adoptions. Um, in the CRM arena, I on the SAP side, and when I was still with an Austrian vendor called at that time Update Marketing, which is now Aurea, they had different, real separated versions. One for fast moving consumer goods, and also for um, um, the health and medical uh, health and medical care, and another big. Uh, arrangement was for industry and machinery. So now back to you, Thomas. <laughs> Lost me totally <laughs> out of my track here. Uh-huh. So, ba- ba- basic, basically, what you are saying is that the promise that is there by terming it industry cloud means making it more digestible for customers of a certain industry, probably even easier to implement with well, lower cycles, low cost, whatever is behind it. So where where are we with that? Is there any vendor that, without naming it, them that is anywhere near to this promise? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think vendors have staked out certain industries that they're mm-hmm. stronger in than others, right? Mm-hmm. And where, but but the limitation becomes, like when you really look at it, even one industry is jam packed with with micro vertical needs mm. that you can really drill into, and so um, you know this is something that I've debated a lot with people like Vinny actually, as far as to what extent can can one vendor really build out industry solutions? And I would say they 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 cannot, and that's why mm. a, a good industry play is an is an evolving thing that involves a platform that helps experts in ISVs build out relevant mm-hmm. functionality and helps customers extend their functionality in meaningful ways. Because I don't, I don't care how many developers you have, you're not building out your solution for all industries. It's not happening. And we, mm-hmm. we have to get a little more realistic about that to help customers understand the art of the possible. Because to your point, like, like when you scratch on the surface, we're not as far along necessarily as 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 we as we as we claim that that we are. And one of the things that really bothers me is is a lot of vendors approach industry clouds with the same old partners that you've heard of, a short list of famous global SIs that supposedly also are expert in all industries. And I push back against that a lot because I think a lot of times if you when you look at vendors who have really good industry plays they also have specialist providers in those industries that really understand mm. that industry inside and out. And I'm not saying that the large firms never don't understand industries. It's just that there's a lot of value in in opening up your platform up to to specialists who who are trusted by customers. So that gets into I can get into a little bit with you on how I think customers should evaluate industry clouds, but the short mm. version of that is please don't think of this as technology. This is I, I, I hate to use the word ecosystem, but you need to evaluate the ecosystem around the software, the community, mm. 
the the expertise, what you can do with those solutions, what your peers are doing, all those things are really, really important versus like, oh, the vendor has some industry cloud for me. This is going to be great. Um, that's not going to work. How, how do these industry clouds differentiate themselves from what we previously had as on-premise industry solutions? <laughs> Apart from the obvious fact that well, they are not on-premise. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, generally speaking, I think what 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 you want to see is you want to see now now what I'm biased towards is like the the multi tenant sort of approach to industry cloud, and I don't want to get too hung up on multi tenancy per se because uh, it the architecture is getting more sophisticated now, and you don't necessarily have to stick with one purist concept. But the idea is is your provider. Uh, applying applications that you can consume and use at economies of scale, easy to update, easy to get new function functionality. This was always a trap with industry as you got caught on this green screen type of software to run your business. And then, and then you had your CRM and your ERP or whatever, and you were trying to integrate these things and make mm. them work. And, and even from a data analytics perspective, this was always difficult. You had these analytics silos. Now, how are you supposed to make sense of your business running analytics silos? You know, and, and now, like, as I referred to, it gets more and more difficult because now you want to start automating workflows across these things. You want to empower business users to do that on their own. You mm -hmm. want to uh, apply some artificial intelligence and some predictive technologies onto these silos. Have fun with that. And so we need a more modern approach to delivering it. And that's what ideally an industry cloud would provide is it would allow you to get rid of some of your legacy industry software and 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 begin to view this as 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 a flexible environment to ralph's point some of that could just be templates um, but it can go far far beyond mm. templates as well the one thing i do want to point out to make our discussion much more confusing and complicated is that the hyperscalers are all emphasizing this also so whether it's amazon azure microsoft has a bunch of things like this um, which are not technically applications in the classic sense right but it's more about cloud services And if you're moving certain services to the cloud, then you have other industry capabilities that are now being built in. IBM has a big one for financial services, for example. So, so industry clouds become something that you need a lot of, a customer needs a lot of guidance from experts like yourselves to understand what it means to them. Because it's not a simple concept to explain, as you can tell. Do you find that what IBM, for instance, is delivering useful? Or is it more or less a joke in the way of uh, I tried to cheat you into my uh, industry solution financials and let you buy my nicest, coolest hardware, which I drive in that special storage center. Oh, and in case you were wondering, IBM is not a sponsor of today's broadcast. So right. Yeah. Go I've ahead. Never transacted. I've never transacted with <laughs> IBM myself. So I, I think they're my wife is an ex IBM -er and I have some shares. So everything is clear. So, so yeah, I mean, part, part of what we, what we want to think about here is that <clears throat> there, I, I found an interesting article before our show that talked about how, uh, one of the impetus behind this is that companies are finding that sort of pure lift and shift hyperscaler moves are hard to justify from a business perspective. And so one of the things that a, that a, that an IBM financial services cloud might attempt to provide is, is a deeper value proposition than just a lift and shift of your, of your online workloads. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that IBM does, they have more, than 100 partners in that industry. So they have done a little bit of that ecosystem legwork, for example. Yeah. And, then yeah. and, then, and, then, and then a lot of this are things like uh, safety, encryption, security, compliance. Yeah. Um, so, so every industry has a bunch of like compliance thresholds that have to be achieved as well. And yeah. so um, if you're going to move to the cloud, you have to jump through those particular hoops. And so the idea is, well, let's... Yeah. Let's let's do that, and then let's provide continued updates on that, so that the customer no longer has to manage that internally. That that can be managed by the provider. And historically, a hyperscaler, like whether it's IBM or Amazon, wouldn't do that. You would still be responsible 
for that yourself. And now with, with the so-called industry cloud framework, they're assuming more responsibility for the regulatory hurdles and stuff. Whether that is, is a, is a good enough business value proposition for, for a customer, as you described, well, I'm not going to answer that question because I'm not in the business of endorsing solutions. I, I want to help customers ask the hard questions. Um, so I, I'm not going to sit here and recommend IBM's industry cloud to you today. But what, but what I will say is that it doesn't really meet my threshold of multi-tenant software. And why do I care so much about that? One of the reasons I care about it is because one of the huge values in, in, a, in a mature industry solution is, is, is the cloud provider taking that aggregated intelligence of how the, those industry customers are using their platform and returning those benchmarks back into the software to help users understand how they perform against their peers, where they're falling short, where they're not. And, and you need the aggregated data to do that. I don't see the hyperscalers being able to do that as easily because these are more like, they're sort of like private workloads in a way. So they're not, I don't get as excited about that, but I also see the value in it. Like, because it is more than just, oh, just move your workload. Now I'm trying to think about why you're moving your workload here. And, and in IBM's case, now I'm going to have a bunch of financial services partners that can talk with you about doing this, which I think adds to the value. Yeah, but on the other hand, a an industry solution, in taking it away from cloud or on-premise or whatever, is ba basically a, a set of processes that is optimized to a certain industry. Mm -hmm. uh, how does a derogatively said bunch of of microservices help there. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I think to me, I think about it, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say, Oh, yay, microservices. Um, I'm, I'm not in the business of like advocating for microservices, nope. but what I, what I am, what I, what I do like, what I do like, and what, what I would encourage if, if you want to think about like, what should customers care about when they, when they look at these solutions? I think one thing customers should be doing is, is saying, what if I have a new industry requirement of some kind? Um, you know, like what if there's a, a new uh, regulation or a new provider if I'm in the construction mm -hmm. industry, for example, um, there, there's a new requirement on a, uh, e ecological uh, regulations around handling certain kinds of materials or whatever. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I build that myself? How difficult it is to build it myself. If I build it myself, will I acquire technical debt? Because in the past, when you mm -hmm. built stuff yourself, you acquired technical debt. Yeah. The idea behind a good industry solution is that you're not going to acquire that technical debt in the same way because you would mm -hmm. build it out either yourself or, or in Ralph's case, maybe you would have a template that you could just modify. Uh, is there a trusted partner in that industry that can help me with this? Can, uh, can they also, do they have the ISV developer competencies to help build out that, that extension or solution? Could it eventually become a more robust application? Could it be shared with other customers? Are other customers building apps that are, and they're sharing those apps as well in more open type exchanges or marketplaces? Yeah. These, these are the interesting questions. And, and to your point, Thomas, how many industries are working like that? Well, probably not very many. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, especially when you move beyond kind of this, the sort of like the, the stomping ground industries of like a professional services where a lot of this starts where, you know, consulting mm -hmm. firms are the first ones to use these, these tools and you start pressing vendors on, well, well, how far, you know, have you gone? Where's your penetration? And then you say, well, and you start asking micro vertical functionality questions and mm -hmm. you realize, uh, you know, it's not there yet, but, but even if you can't build it all yourself, if you can make it easy for customers and partners to to feasibly build these solutions, but in trusted ways that don't break when you when you upgrade, mm -hmm. that's that's a totally different paradigm than the than the technical debt paradigm of customizing. If you can do it, if it works, mm -hmm. are they victims of their own success? I mean, in a, it wasn't that long ago when the uh, the the state of the art in customizing for an industry was custom objects and custom fields in a horizontal application mm. now right yeah you, you know what i'm getting at i yeah. hope you know what i'm getting at because i can't yeah. finish my own sentence <laughs> yeah well look i mean sorry I, mean, I got my 
COVID booster yesterday and I'm still a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, I, I had that I had that vibe. I'm glad I didn't do the video show the week uh, mm. the week I did my COVID booster. I don't think I would have been coherent at all. Mm. I mean, um I there there's one vendor I know. I'm not gonna name them because they're a Diginomica partner. I don't want to get into the commercial side of this, but um Mid market is a fertile ground for industry solutions, which is another topic we didn't touch on. Um, but but there's some good reasons for that when you look at it, right? Because smaller SMB types don't often have the depth of vertical needs and requirements. They do sometimes, exactly. Exactly. Um, but but they don't. And and then and then large companies sometimes have more sophisticated resources they can apply to these problems. So mid market is often where the press for this kind of happens, where you have. It's a little bit of a generalization, but it, it more sophisticated businesses, but but not the deep IT resources of the largest firms, um, and and this is where you know, like to Thomas's point, they they probably can't afford to build a microservices architecture themselves, so they're mm -hmm. looking for uh, for sophisticated solutions providers that can do that, and you know, um, in a lot of industries they don't have that yet either uh, for. E ERP or for CRM, but like in the case of ERP, I'm thinking of a construction industry e example where a vendor I know that I happen to think does a really good job with user experience and stuff like that, multi-tenant ERP built a, the first multi-tenant ERP for construction. And so they go into these uh, customer sites. Now, now what's the impact here? The impact here is if, if you build it right, I can get rid of my proprietary crappy construction software. Why does that matter? Well, because first of all, kids hate it. So, you know, you, your, your older workforce has used that software all their lives. Yeah. So, so they're used to that. But, but have fun recruiting the younger generation to use your green screen software with no mobile application that they can access for. Have fun with that, right? Yeah. So it become th this older software becomes a real impediment uh, on the talent side. Yeah. So now I can move some of that out. Um, now um, I, 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 have, I don't have a dividing wall between my ERP and my construction software. I have a better experience. I have mobile applications. I have a partner who can help me to extend that as, as more needs come up. So, so, but I, I know how Thomas's brain works. He's saying, well, what is the catch here? Now, now this sounds like dreamy. This is like Walt Disney or something. No, it's not dreamy. And here's the reason why, because decades of requirements were built into these older solutions. And yeah. while, while they don't update very regularly, they still have a lot of years under their belt. So customers look at these newer industry solutions and they say, well, your technology is super cool, microservices based, whatever but it doesn't have everything I need to run my business. And that's the gaps that needs to get closed because yeah. you can only compromise on functionality that runs your business to a certain extent. Now, what what is interesting is that I have run into customers in various industry solution areas like this where they will compromise a little bit if they love the user experience and they and they like the roadmap and they're confident because the vendor puts out the SaaS vendor puts out these updates on a much more regular consumable basis. They'll compromise a little bit more on functionality than you would think, but there's only a point because beyond that point you can't run your business and that's one of the reasons why these industry clouds are slow to take off is because this is mission critical stuff and I'm not going to compromise that for your software but on the other hand on the CRM side if I'm if I are if I'm already have mission mission critical stuff running and you come in with a CRM that is more catered to my industry than your competition well that's kind of a no brainer right because I'm not abandoning any mission critical software at that point I'm just consuming CRM that is better for my users. So it kind of depends on what type of software you're talking about, I think, here. I mean, there, there must be a reason that the core banking systems still are in high demand and the, that we still see job ads for COBOL programmers, right? So it's, yeah. I mean, no they surprise are all. efficient, no surprise. they are stable, and yeah. well, new systems often have the risk of, of not supporting enough there. Yeah. Because I may add, as yeah. I am living not far away from one of the most important European bank places, Frankfurt, that I have a lot of contacts into one large German bank and they have um, highly sophisticated liaison with one of the vendors we named earlier and they even... Um, 
sold, um, um, sort, not sorted out, but um, got rid of one of their CEOs and made them Geschäftsführer of uh, one of those large banks. Managing um, director. They, they, managing the, they manifested that um, far, fear, uncertainty, and doubt um, in getting into the cloud, and they do it only in small steps. Now they have yeah. made a lot of progress in different of these larger banks, and I see that they try to adopt mm -hmm. um, cloud technology in departments and in some specific areas, such as key accounts are used in one cloud solution software from one vendor, um, standard account users uh, or private account users with another. But the core system is still old-fashioned, even that it's mm -hmm. partly cloud, but still under their control. They do not trust these nasty environments and the vendors which sell the software. Sure. There is a certain distrust. Yeah? Absolutely. To overcome uh, that. I think this is going to lead to there being uh, apprenticeships in COBOL for the next generation. <laughs> it, the language is never going away. Well, People are going to teach their grandkids. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. It's from that perspective, but what I saw as a real progress and what I like in our discussion is that there are bits and pieces in certain industries where they have a certain addiction to try new stuff and there are more conservatives, right, which have um, a high... Um, value in staying to a certain degree very conservative but trusted because they want to give their customers a very good gut feeling and reliability. So um, in industry, and you mentioned small, medium businesses or middle market, what are there the interesting aspects to go for such we have one vendor, CRM in the cloud, who has uh, done a lot in industry stuff and i was fascinated to see that through partners like you mentioned and if you have a reliable partner you can do on a platform and i name now a platform zoho as i see zoho as a platform but more technology i do not find yet through partners industry specific solution packs yeah right Where's yeah, the right. I'm, right. I mean, you know, the the in my view, the idea is that you, when when you're an enterprise software vendor, trying to help customers modernize, you think about this platform perspective, and you think about how you're going to attract partners that are experts in certain industries. One of the interesting things is you have to think about the developer community part as well, because a lot of the best like industry experts aren't used to building apps and software and don't have those competencies in house. And so uh, as a big fan of industry cloud type stuff, though, I don't like to use the word, as I said, um, I, I like following the evolution of this. So I like talking with, with expert services firms about how they built their first app and how they hired mm -hmm. their first developer and how they started to realize that they needed to really double down on intellectual property of various kinds whether it's like um, the thought leadership type stuff or whether it's building applications and on a platform that they can trust. And, you know, if that's Zoho or some other CRM, you know, that can be a real value add. But to your point, you have to build that out. I mean, and you have to, you have to have a platform that's convincing to the outside. And if, if your platform is too private and internally, then it gets more difficult here because now, now it's on you to build out all the industry functionality yourself and you're not necessarily an expert in that industry. Yeah. I mm. mean, domain domain expertise is so important to this type of software development. It just cannot be overstated. And 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 what you really want is you want the developer and that domain expert to to be literally in the same room, you know, like where I'm looking over your shoulder and I'm like a crusty 20-year veteran of of the insurance industry and you're a young coder and you're saying, well, what do you think about that? And I'm saying, well, you got rid of that screen, but you also got rid of four configuration options that are really important in this industry. So you have to get those back, you know, because there's always that tension between 
uh, young developers want to do sexy, simple interfaces that are really easy to use. And the industry expert wants all the configuration options. And how do you do that? It's a real, it takes a real skill. So one of the things I really like to help vendors with is to think about mashups. How do you mash up your developer community with your industry expert community and get those people talking? Because that's where it starts to come together and building apps and also making those resources available to customers so that they can bring in those people, hire those people. And it takes, takes a very different mentality than like, oh, we're going to build it all ourselves, you know? Yeah, if you can get them in the same room, it's Mm -hmm. great. If you can get them in the same shoes, yeah, you know, there's something else. But yeah. I don't yes. know how how easy that is to do. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not easy, but you know, there's definitely, you know, one of the things for younger developers. I think right now is disillusion with big tech. Uh, you know, the big tech companies aren't as cool and awesome as they appeared, maybe. And so maybe it's fun to actually learn how to build hard, solve hard industry problems. I would like to think that some developers could be persuaded in that direction. But to your point, there's a learning curve around industry stuff. And that's the reason why we're drawn to it, I think, because we can still get paid in our 40s, 50s, and 60s and not become, you know, and maybe beyond, you know, and not become irrelevant to those, to those brilliant, talented young people, which is great because if, you know, otherwise I would feel very vulnerable to these talented kids, but like you do learn stuff Mm. and, and it's that dialogue that is so important. And that's why the industry cloud term is so fundamentally disappointing is because it doesn't capture any of that. It doesn't, it it implies that we rolled out this great technical solution that solved these problems. Whereas what really solves these problems are gathering a bunch of really smart people virtually or in person and figuring out how we solve these problems in a, in a better way to Thomas's point where, you know, where, how do we become more microservices based? You know, like how do we do it? it, It's one thing if you're Netflix starting from scratch, but if you're a a bank that's been in business for a hundred years, well, how how do you do that? And, and to Ralph's point, how fast should you proceed? You know, like, like, in other words, are there going to be challenger banks that come up? I mean, industries are very different in their dynamics, right? Like where some industries, you can have a challenger emerge overnight with modern new functionality that really threatens you. Mm. In other industries, it it moves much slower. And, and, but, but what is the pace of change? And, And industry really presses the issue as far as how quickly should I, should I be changing? Because the user expects so much more, how how patient are they going to be? Like I I don't know about you guys, but like I'm very impatient with banks because I don't think banks are offering the kind of experience that I want. I mean I I just I just got my one of my banks got acquired by another bank and they sent me the new portal. I have totally different logins for my business credit line versus my accounts. Mm-hmm. Like cool. that's that, that, nuts. That's yeah. so cool. uh, yeah. You know. It's- Absolutely nuts. And if a larger bank or one which has uh, a certain backup by the state buys the more efficient, more effective, um, business-oriented bank and has less private customers but a lot of business customers, has the better IT system, and the larger is saying, uh, 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 we go back to Stone Age. Yeah, We have there still some dinosaurs around the corner. And not your fuzzy, nitty-gritty stuff. Uh-uh. Uh, it was like a flashback back into the Stone Age when I came to the next time to the portal. Disgusting. Yeah. And it's slowly. And, and uh, so, Maybe okay. you are with the same bank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I honestly was not very pleased. And to put it in the late queen, I was not amused. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, by not amused means I'm really getting mad on lousy services, or even getting something which was quite nice to make it worse. Yeah, and if, if a merge is going in that direction, it it's not to my liking. As a customer, yeah. I try to quit as quick as possible. I'm faster than hell. Yeah, but mm. uh, where I want to go is. What do we have for benefits for, for instance, a small medium enterprise where my heart is beating for um, in, in mm. finding a solid solution for a craftsman, 
somebody who has a little um, advertising agency or um, where is he benefiting from those suppliers and vendors in the CRM area which are utilizing Amazon or Google or the Azure environment? Yeah. Mm. Are there yeah. Any, or is it just yeah. marketing? Well, yes and no. I mean, obviously, a smaller business isn't going to benefit from sophisticated hyperscaler relationships because they're not going to, you know, it's like, oh, I just renegotiated all my cloud workloads at scale or whatever. That's not going to happen. Um, but, but, but I think one one thing I think about from an SMB perspective is that the more you can do your customer business under one consolidated interface, the better off you are. I mean, it. The, the data and the analytics part of this is so powerful for smaller companies to be able to get a really good view of like, and now they may need an expert to go over it with them, but it's like, hey, did you notice that you have 80% growth customers in this area, but only 50% in this area, but you're emphasizing the 50% area so much more. But when you look at a lot of smaller businesses that you described, a lot of them have they might be using cloud software, but they're still probably using five or six different pieces of cloud software and they don't have any integrated analytics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more you can get them into a more integrated type of environment, you know, the the better off you are. Um, But, but the problem becomes of course, that the integrated environments are more generic. And Mm -hmm. so they may not have the specialty needs for that particular proprietor. Mm -hmm. And so now they're, they have a patchwork quilt of solutions and -hmm. how do they make informed decisions about their business? Because a a larger business can say, well, let's dump that all into Tableau or let's dump that all into it. Let's dump all that data into some analytics provider and then we'll try to make sense of it. Maybe we'll build a lake house or some crap. Well, a smaller business can't do that. So they're like, I mean, I don't know about, about you all because I think most of us run smaller businesses, but but patchwork quilt of data and analytics is a huge enemy to making sense of our future direction. Mm-hmm. So you what I found think quite that analytics is a main driver uh, of industry solutions or for industry solutions? Well, it, it's one of the drivers. It's not the only driver because uh-huh. I think – I think, um, like, so for example, if you switch gears back to the large enterprise, mm. I, I've noticed that some some pitch that, but the problem, of course, is that, you know, you can do analytics in a third party environment, and so mm. if you have the resources to move your data to a third party, mm. you can you can do that without updating all of your software. But but I, I think the more persuasive things are things like um, automating workflows across processes, and mm. and you know the pandemic really exposed that for us because. We had so many broken processes more than we realized. Mm-hmm. You know that required that required all these paper, ridiculous paper steps, mm-hmm. and 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 we got jolted into this thing of like, how do we serve customers in in a more connected way? Because I can't go into the office and sign this document. It's like I got exposed here, and and so this the power of like using these so called low code environments. You know, which really have been around for a long time, but the idea is like, can I, uh, as a business user, can I create like these building blocks and say, I want this to go from here to there, uh, yeah. w- without any manual interference, and I want to build that on my own. To me, that's part of the promise of these industry clouds, if they're set up properly, is that you can start to do things like that, yeah. that in in ways that work for your particular customers and um but you know we're not a lot of this isn't there yet right and so it's mm. a lot of this is road mappy type stuff yeah. so the, there you touched on a couple of interesting points actually you touched on some of them already before but i mean we have the demand for industry specific solutions basically forever so and, and we had yeah. industry specific solutions also back back in the 90s already and then they somehow went into the basement into the back of our minds yeah why why do they come back only now because <laughs> i don't see a specific reason for that mm. it, is it a technology deficiency that we created by moving to the cloud yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think I think it's different. I mean, I would like to think that some of this is that the pain points were never really solved. Um, I think that, like I said, I think part of it is the world has changed and what businesses need to com- compete now requires 
much more modern experiences that mm. you know I, I described that sort of green that notorious green screen interface thing mm -hmm. um the world is changing very quickly now and so i think it's it's really difficult to be in environments where you're stuck on old software and trying to serve your customers and so that there's i think there's a little bit of an imperative coming from the customer side that you never really you rolled out some software but you never really fundamentally solved my problems so i think that's part of it but i think from a vendor side part of it is just growth i mean when you talk to vendors about this they say we think we have untapped markets here and of mm -hmm. course uh vet whether they're publicly traded or funded by venture capitalists the growth imperative is the same which is you know, what, you know, horizontal applications can take us this far, but um, but vertical applications for very specific areas can take us much further into new markets. And so, uh, to, I I hope that doesn't sound too cynical, but I think growth is a big part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, speaking, I think I cut off Marshall. Uh, only only a little bit. Uh, something that I was thinking about as we were talking about the complexities that get added uh, is the issue of uh, portability. Something that you know, we have to consider is that not every industry-specific implementation is going to be greenfield. Uh, yep. There are going to be peop uh, people, the customers who are you know changing from vendor a to vendor b and you know they don't care about any of the other stuff they want their industry specific solution that they have crafted to be able they want to be able to do their shit on the next platform too yep and how how are vendors providing for that? You know, is it is do they have the same level of uh, transferability that more horizontal applications do? Like you know, CRM is CRM. You know, you can go mm. from uh, you know Salesforce to Zoho to uh, Oracle. You know, it's relatively easy to jump around, but maybe not so much with the verticals. No, it's not always not always easy to jump, like you said. I mean, especially because you have to be very careful about the functionality that you compromise on. You know, I mean, I you know, I kind of talked. I alluded to some of this before, but it kind of since we talked for a while now, I guess I should roll out my little criteria that I think customers should be asking about. I mean, one one of the big things is um, functionality. Uh, you know, I wanna I wanna look at a bunch of solutions and so-called industry cloud solutions that claim to be from my industry and I want to really kick tires on them. So so now now I want to see how much of this stacks up because the more that you have in your existing roadmap that I can consume via templates and configured solutions, the better off I'm going to be. Um, but it's also just the trust factor of the relationship. Like, can you speak to my requirements? Do you understand them, right? Like, I don't yeah. want someone who, who can just show me how to configure something. I want someone to say... Well, yeah. yeah, you can. I want someone to be able to say, "Well, yeah, you can do it that way." But do you realize that most of your peers are providing sixty-day payment terms or whatever it is? I want yeah. someone that challenges me on that, not just, "Oh, you know. yeah, you can, you can do that." So that's that's one thing. The sex. So I, I want to make sure you have experts. I want to make sure you have experts either inside your company or with a trusted services partner. So that yeah. needs evaluating. Then there's a whole platform evaluation, Marshall, that you alluded to, which is. How easy it is for, for me to build on, on your platform and do I acquire technical debt when I build? Or can a partner build for me? Um, so that's where the bake-off comes in. I have seen industry-specific situations on these platforms if they're working right. Uh, I had one partner tell me about a big deal that they won where they beat some other vendors because the customer brought up this complex labor relations unionization requirement they wow. went away for the weekend and brought back a prototype on Monday and said, we can build this for you on that platform. What? Uh, and, That's and, a winner and, right there. And, and, and this is unheard of 10 years yeah. ago. Like, like that's, and, and to, to, to talk about the differences and I'm not trying to push the new terms, but that, that wasn't possible 10 years ago. So, so, so you're looking for platforms that allow some of those things to be possible. Um, yeah. So that's, so that's really important. 
And then, like I said, I think I think the multi-tenant SaaS question is important. And, and, it, it, and it's just a series of architecture questions like microservices. Mm. What does your architecture look like? How how um, resilient is it? What can I do with it? Then, of course, there's all kinds of security and compliance questions we could mm. we, we kind of understand as well. But all those things come up. And then what does the community look like around this? Like, can I talk to some peers? Are they no. active online? Can I meet with them at shows? Do you have industry-specific seminars and events? Some of the really good vertical communities actually gather these people together. Um, yeah. I talked. To, I talked to one uh, one guy who had done this within a within a, a cloud ERP financials area where he had built out. And I wrote about this on Diginomica, but he he built out uh, faith-based communities. So he wouldn't he would invite CFOs of religious organizations to an annual show, and wow. you know. And and so you, you you don't have a huge crowd, but you have if you have if you're a CFO of a of a faith based organization, you can meet like with with mm-hmm. 200 other CFOs in your same situation. Yeah. That's yeah. just incredibly powerful, and that goes yeah. so yeah. far beyond yeah. the software. And so all these things customers need to look really really hard at, not just oh it's so great that they have an industry cloud in my area on their website that their marketing team's excited about. They need to look at, take a hard look at some, and that wasn't a comprehensive list, but that just gives you some example of how I think about it. Yeah. The user community aspect, I I like very, very much because it's one of the trust building aspects what you have here in Germany Mm. as a very uh, in-depth point of German angst and um, being afraid of that anything can go wrong, will go wrong. They always see Murphy around the corner. And um, what um, I like, very honest, is to have a word from you. And um, if there are advantages also in that kind of mesh technology, where you have something still in an on-premise design, but you have some mesh designed nice sexy grease and portable um, uh, end user machines such smartphone tablets laptop in posh GUI and then if you go in the admin area <laughs> you are back in the stone age yeah mm. and they do not do real honest cloud solution but you can get it hosted and you get a uh, tunneled web access via VPN or something like that or uh, Citrix or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just add to that point that um, that what I'm hoping to see is much more industry consortiums as well and open source type community involvement. And, you know, a lot of companies have been reluctant in the past to share this kind of stuff with their peers for competitive reasons. But I think more and more there's a growing realization that we can at least share certain core things so we don't have to reinvent the wheel on certain industry needs, even if we retain some of our core specialized technology and don't share that. But that's an interesting question. But to your point, yes, some of these mesh frameworks, I mean, look, to Mar- Marshall talked about this earlier, not every one of these situations is greenfield by any means. And so if you have to be able to show companies how, how they can progress in these areas because most companies don't have an appetite for massive multi-year modernization products right now. So they have to be able to feel like you have a stepping stone methodology for them that mm-hmm. allows them to begin to add these components in a, in a meaningful in a meaningful way. And so, so yes, absolutely you need that. And like you said, maybe the back end looks a little bit ugly. Um, the priority and this is a CRM convos conversation, the priority is the customer experience, not the back end. Um, hopefully we improve the back end over time because the back end does matter. But the, the priority is the customer experience. You know, So the priority is don't show me, don't show me two different logins for my business loan and my, and my checking account or whatever. Like that's the priority. Um, what, what you have to do on the back end to make that possible is a lesser consideration. But it does matter because architecture ultimately can hold us back or, or free us. And so we do have to pay attention to the back end. It's just that we have a more margin for error and more time on the back end than we do on the front. Yeah. And before Thomas is asking the question of all questions, um, an observation <laughs> I would like to share. Answer. Yeah, 42 is the answer. I know um, an observation that between classical and lightning, just to mention these two worlds, the admins in the old world had done a job in three minutes and in the new world they need 30 
The user mm. doesn't see the difference. Only if he needs help, then he gets his admin into shit. Yeah. Right. And mm. this is since 2008 unsolved. And this is an interesting aspect I found out. Yeah. Yeah. And, absolutely. Um, I love that the user is happy. Now back to Thomas with the question of a question. Well, the user needs to be happy. Ultimately, the user is the reason for purchase, purchasing the software. Right. I'd, I'd like to twist your words a little or give them a twist about okay. the ecosystem part that is very necessary. And I totally agree. But does make, doesn't this make the industry play or industry solution, industry cloud play, however we want to call it, a, a game for the big boys mm. instead of um, giving smaller players a, a reasonably strong chance? Because, I mean, setting up an ecosystem and a, a, using that term now, a, a an ISV infrastructure setting up industry-specific events that are by nature fairly limited doesn't that require resources yeah well you, you know it's inter it's, it's interesting in that there? case yeah. it's the the example i gave you was a was a mid, small mid market example this was not mm. a huge firm this mm. was a bootstrap firm that built all of that himself now mm. i will grant you that creating your own events is a uh, is an art form that a lot of people should stay away from <laughs> um, but but i but but i do think it's possible to piggyback on the larger vendors events in many cases as well um and and create like a industry gathering within the context of an already existing event and kind of piggyback onto that mm -hmm. but no okay. i don't believe this stuff is out of reach of of the mid market at all now and it does depend on the software platform in this case this faith-based what they had done is sort of more ralph's template stuff they had figured out this mm -hmm. particular platform i'm trying not to use too many vendor names because i don't want to yeah. just be a vendor endorser it has a lot of configurability around specific uh you know, financial mm -hmm. verticals. And so it was able to do this without coding, but the vendor's also building a coding solution for oil and gas that's a little more sophisticated that requires mm -hmm. more development resources. Mm -hmm. So that's a little more upping the ante a little bit, but there's a whole lot you can do in a lot of software with, with, with templated approaches and specialized configuration because mm -hmm. it's really more about knowing the right how to do it and what the right configurations are, to your point, which is like, you know, and you don't have to be a huge firm to, to do that. You just have to find software that's powerful enough to give you at least some ability to configure those those options and then to educate the customer on what the what the best approaches are for that. Well, that still means that there needs to be one big boy that gives the foundation. Yeah, right. And and that's the whole thing in the mid market, right? Is that mm. they you do need something, something out of the box to work with and you can't build it all yourself. Um, this is not some um, happy uh, panacea that's going to solve problems. Mm -hmm. all, all it does is it, it it gives us a different way to have this conversation than just talking about horizontal applications, mm -hmm. and and it, and it, and then it gives us a, a bridge into a conversation about artificial intelligence and workflow automation and things like that, which are really not possible when you have an overly siloed environment. It just isn't. So mm -hmm. you you have to begin to tackle this, but it just depends on the industry how urgent these situations are. You know, I look at the airline industry and it's like, well, what is their imperative to change? You know, um, that's a that's a big boy industry, but it's like, you know, how much customer choice do we really have to press companies like this? This is part of the problem with industry is that in some industries, the the the, the giants are too comfortable and they dictate the terms to everybody else. You know, in retail, we see that a lot with Amazon and Walmart dictating the terms to so many different suppliers. And like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so at that point, like, you have to run the software that they want you to and do things the way they want you to. And mm -hmm. so, you know, this is not some dreamland, but I do think these are the right conversations to have. And I hope customers can learn from them to be more critical about these terms, but also see the possibilities because we have to, our job is to do both. We have to show customers the possibilities, but also make sure they're appropriately skeptical because a lot of this is coming from marketing departments, not from true needs. Mm -hmm. so. so beyond the conversation we're having right now, 
Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry for suggesting that there's more work that we should be doing. What mm. should the analysts, the consultants, the industry watchers be doing about this? You know, what, how can we improve the situation? Is there anything on us or is it just a matter of yelling at vendors <laughs> till they <laughs> get <laughs> shit right? Well, I think we need to press vendors on their roadmaps and which industries they're committed to, which industries they're involving partners with and, and pressing them on, on, on what they mean when they use the word industry cloud. Uh, I think uh, I, I view part of that job as documenting customer examples and pain points and priorities. And, you know, for me, I, you know, I take a customer use case perspective. So I'm always looking for customers and trying to understand what, what they need and where, where these vendors are falling short and trying to communicate that. Sometimes we can do a better job of that than the customer themselves. It might sound strange, but some customers feel compromised in their communications with vendors for whatever reason. And so mm -hmm. I feel like our job, especially behind closed doors, is to press vendors on the hard questions that customers may not get the chance to ask or be able mm -hmm. to ask for whatever reason. And, you know, but I, I, I try to have these conversations as transparently as possible. I know a lot of vendors would prefer to have them under NDA and stuff like that. I don't <laughs> think that's healthy. I don't think that's healthy. I think certain roadmap things are NDA appropriate, but for the most part, I think we should be having these conversations openly in the public domain. There's nothing more refreshing than having a vendor admit what they're not good at. And, and the industries like getting a vendor to admit the industries that they're not going to play in is a big breakthrough because then you understand the direction that they're taking. They don't like to do that. They like to pretend like, Oh, we can do this. We can do that. And you know, it's like, but where are you focusing your resources and talent? You know? And, and so if we can do that and, and have these more public versions of this conversation with vendors, I think we do everyone a service, but even behind closed doors, we should be pressing these issues. Yeah, they never seem to want to admit a lack. Yeah. They don't want to admit a lack, but no. if they do, you know, it, it's not so. They've got to learn that it's not a big deal because yeah. every company has a lack, and if yeah. vendor A tries to take a shot at vendor B for what they're not doing well, vendor mm. B can shoot right back at what they're not doing mm. right. Yeah. I appreciate an honest word, for instance, as we had with one of the um, protagonists in the open source environment and his CRM solution. And he said, yeah, it sometimes is cool, but sometimes um, it is critical. And especially um, I prefer to say where I'm good at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But nothing builds trust with customers more than saying what you're not good at and not doing. Here and we that's go. what vendors don't understand. Yeah. And it is, isn't yeah. this whole thing admitting where one is not good at the perfect partnering opportunity means that this is rather yep. a deficiency of their you know. network strategy? Well, right. And that's where the platform evaluation comes mm -hmm. into play because with the proper platform, you can evaluate partners. Um, and, and involve them. Uh, one of the cloud ERP vendors I'm thinking of uh, built an entire manufacturing vertical via a partner, which which to some vendors is totally unheard of. Um, mm. But but you have to have the platform in order to do that. Otherwise, it's just empty promises. Mm. So, oh, this partner is getting involved, blah, blah, blah. Well, how are they getting involved? Like, how does that work? I mean, these are the questions we have to probe, you know? Mm. Yeah. By the way, I have a I have another meeting in one minute. Uh, we okay. got we got stacked up because I'm like last minute <laughs> yep. hurricane yep. replacement. So I think okay. I have to head out and let you guys wrap it on your own. But thank you for having me. No worries. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Appreciate it. For, us. In general, for pitching and in on that short minute. notice. Wow, that was fast. And Hallelujah. And that was good. And then yeah. like that. John is always yeah. good for. <laughs> Strong and opinions I, I and wisdom. <laughs> yeah. That he has his list. He shared parts of this list. And there is more what one can learn and listen to uh, as he has his podcasts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, good stuff in writing. And it is always uh, one 
if you know that friendly image, if you make a remark in LinkedIn where you have that bulb, you're thinking bulb or hmm, that is inspiring me. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of inspiring moments. I have um, listening and reading all the materials with Giganomica is sharing. And um, so we have done now a bit promotional thing um, towards our friend as well. And mm -hmm. um, I'm very happy yeah. to see um, that it worked out. And thanks, Thomas, yeah. that you took the opportunity to ask him that he could win him. Well. <laughs> and hey, we still get a chance to talk to Vinny Merchandani another day. Yes. Assuming he stays safe. Vinny, if you're watching this, take care of yourself. Hurricanes are not fun when you're in the middle of them. We'll talk to you soon. Yep. Okay. And thanks for everybody who is still there. See you next week. And we'll make up another one with Vinny, who already said so. <laughs> so <laughs> not all is lost. <laughs> Goodie. Going backstage. See you next week. Shalom. <laughs> Bye.